This episode of Light On, Light Through is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at audiblepodcast.com slash light on. There are over 75,000 titles to choose from for your iPod, iPhone, or MP3 player. To Light On, Light Through, Episode 78, The Lincoln Penny and the VDB Litho, an interview with illustrator Joel Iskowitz. Well, here in August 2010, I thought I'd do something a little different, something you haven't yet heard on Light On, Light Through. I'm going to interview a world-renowned artist. This guy has designed coins in the United States, including the Lincoln Penny, stamps in the United Kingdom. He's done work for NASA, the Boy Scouts of America. And you know what else is so special about this illustrator? Well, he and I were friends over 50 years ago in PS96 in the Bronx, in the fifth and sixth grades. So... Here, then, is an interview. It's close to about 30 minutes, no commercial interruptions. And at the end of the interview, stay tuned because I'll tell you how you can meet Joel Iskowitz and see some of his artwork. The Light on Light Through podcast. Well, Joel, it is great to be talking to you over Skype and for this podcast. And as I mentioned in my intro, you and I go back a long way, a really long way, over 50 years, and we've been out of touch for a long time. It's been a real joy to get back uh, in touch with you. And what I want to talk to you about today is your work on the Lincoln Penny. And let me just say, by way of brief introduction, that when I was a kid, and maybe a little older than when you and I were first friends, uh, you know, 12, 13, 14, I used to be a coin collector. And, of course, the great prize, or one of the great prizes in coin collection, when you pick up a roll of pennies, is if you were fortunate enough to find the 1909 SVDB penny which was an incredible rarity. And I was never that lucky to find it, but you were lucky in a very different way regarding the Lincoln VDB penny. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved, not by going back in a time machine uh, to 1909, but, uh, well, just over a year ago in 2009. Well, Paul, first of all, let me just say how great it is to speak to you, even through uh, Skype, uh, not as, as, as great as in person, but we'll be doing that again soon. It, it's really strange, though, Paul, because our, our, our own history uh, and everything I seem to be experiencing lately almost seems to be through the filter of some sort of a time machine and some sort of time warp. This business with, with a penny, uh, the business of uh, speaking to you this very moment uh, via Skype, it's all kind of, a, as another Paul, Paul Simon said, a kind of a world of miracle and wonder. And I just get more dazzled uh, as the days get by and my hair gets grayer. At least you still have some hair. <laughs> One of the many things I'm thankful for, but in terms of thankfulness, in terms of appreciation, in terms of, you know, you know, kind of, you know, trying to wrap your mind around some of the, the wonder and some of the miracles. Yeah, we, we, we kind of share that uh, experience uh, very closely. You and I did growing up in in, um, in, in the Bronx in Ike's post post war era uh, America. Penny to us was was our um you know, it was the most familiar piece of, of coinage. It was the most familiar piece of currency. It, it was, um, it's humble in, in, in worth and humble in nature. And, and uh, of course, you know, this great, great icon, this, this great president uh, who was revered uh, throughout the world and for the ages 
uh, by so many is probably most present, his most present image emblazoned in all our minds since we first saw him on that penny. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's overwhelming to me. I have to pinch myself to think that 100 years after the 1909 issue, which was groundbreaking uh, because it was the first time that an actual living human being was depicted on our currency, circulating currency, you know, that has a whole wonderful history and, and meaning and backstory in itself. Uh, but these two gentlemen, Victor David Brenner of the VDB fame you spoke of, conspired uh, benevolently with uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and he was uh, in a position as president and with his, his, um, his particular governing style, broke that new ground. And, and um, they did put Lincoln on the centennial of his birth on, on the penny. And then 100 years later, to think after seeing so many pennies and playing with so many pennies and, and uh, being educated by my brother. I was never a coin collector, but he educated me about, you know, the mint marks and uh, who was on that penny. And, um, and uh, we saw it so, it was so um, omnipresent in our lives. It's just amazing to me to think that my design as a professional artist is part of that lineage and part of that history, helps it tell part of that story, which is, um, which is a, an absolutely wonderful story. We see it unfolding right now in 2010 uh, with our current president. And so it's, it's, uh, it's uh, an enormously um, expansive uh, range of images and thoughts that, that fill my, my mind when I think of it. Well, tell us how you came then to do this new design for the 2009 penny and, and then about the uh, marvelous lithograph. I, I assume that's the right word. I'm, I'm more or less an ignoramus when it comes to uh, visual things. But that marvelous uh, drawing that you did of Theodore Roosevelt and uh, Brenner talking about things that led to the uh, penny. No need to slight your, your uh, erudition and intelligence, Paul. Uh, you're absolutely right on both score, scores. The original drawing of that scene, uh, it's a historic uh, moment uh, that I had envisioned but uh, in, in the lithograph, but it actually tries to recreate that moment uh, that did indeed happen back in 1908 in, in Oyster Bay, Long Island, when, uh, when uh, Victor David Brenner, who was a premier medalist of the time, uh, was um, given this uh, prestigious commission to uh, sketch and then create the Panama Canal Service Medal. So he was invited for lunch. There's a New York Times article that mentions Victor David Brenner on the guest list that particular date in, in the summer. I forget the specific date now. I think it was July 8th of 1908. Brenner's there in, in TR's library sketching him and uh, had the good presence of mind uh, to take along a uh, to take along a, uh, uh, a plaquette or or um, uh, a medal uh, a profile of Lincoln that essentially is the uh, was the the model for the profile on what became the the, the scent Roosevelt as Brenner did uh, revered Lincoln and Roosevelt had his own a uh, very unique history with, with Lincoln because Teddy Roosevelt Sr., his father, who in the lithograph, there's uh, a, a, an oil portrait that, that's prominent in the background of his father because Teddy Roosevelt had in his library a, uh, a wall of honor. Uh, most prominent among these luminaries that he revered was his father, uh, who worked in the, in the Lincoln administration and was, uh, became very close with Mary Todd Lincoln so Teddy Roosevelt Sr. actually gave, uh, mentioned this to you when we had um, our meeting in Manhattan, gave uh, his son a, a ring, which was the custom of the time, uh, with uh, some of Lincoln's hair embedded in, in it, and um, asked his son to take his oath of office at his inauguration wearing that ring. Of course, it was treasured by Teddy Roosevelt. So there was that history 100 years ago, and fast forward in our time machine, Paul, 100 years later, this, this uh, citizen, myself, yours truly, gets the opportunity to, as a freelance artist, to uh, enter into um, 
uh, a call, a nationwide call for artists by the United States Mint to help invigorate and enhance American coinage and help create a new renaissance uh, of American coinage, uh, just the way a uh, hundred years earlier, Teddy Roosevelt, he called it his pet crime. He single-handedly uh, uh, took the uh, self-imposed assignment of choosing the very finest artists and sculptors uh, to help create a renaissance in, in American coinage. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, his first choice was uh, Saint Augustus St. Gaudens, and, uh, who is the... Uh, uh, behind what's considered uh, uh, by many to be uh, the most beautiful uh, coin, uh, the Striding Liberty Gold. Right, that beautiful Art Nouveau flowing hair. Absolutely breathtaking. And of course, at this time, uh, you know, uh, St. Gardens was passed on. And uh, so uh, Brenner kind of uh, stepped up to the plate here and... Um, created this one image that actually, uh, it's, it seems staggering since I hyperbole, but it, uh, the Lincoln scent is the most reproduced object of art in human history. It's, a, it's quite a mouthful. It's a sweeping statement, but it's true. Sure, because there are so many pennies out there. You know, let me just say one thing that's uh, occurring to me as I'm listening to you talk is we live, obviously, in this digital age. I've written a lot about it. All of the digital forms of communication give us, well, just really tiny blips on screens that we can't really hold in our hands. We might be able to poke them and poke an icon and get something out of them, but they're virtual. They are like Plato's shadows on a cave. And yet at the same time, as I hear you talking about coins, you can't get much more tactile than holding a coin in your hand. And, and here we are in 2010 uh, in this digital flush, still very much interested in, in these gleaming little things, not only for their spending power, and let's face it, coins don't buy much anymore, but basically for their history and, and just the ability to hold this history right in your hand. You know, it's amazing you're, you're, you're saying these things, Paul. My, my mind is reeling with the different reference points uh, and, and thinking, number one, I'll kind of work uh, you know, backward uh, on this. Uh, it's amazing uh, to give an adult person a shiny new penny sometimes that I've, uh, I've had occasion to do uh, and see the gleam in their eye and see the, the pleasure and the delight. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of it. Everyone has a history uh you know, Lincoln himself, of course, is nearly universally, you know, adored and revered. But the penny itself, as you say, is as an object, is um, is something that uh, holds a very special place in our hearts. Uh, mostly because I think, as I said earlier, you know, uh, it was introduced to us and it was our form of currency. But it was so ubiquitous; we were so familiar with it. And you're right in this digital age of of kind of, uh, as you say. Plato's shadows, false connections, imagery uh, that that may not truly be, um, you know, connecting us. In some ways, it's it, it does. In some ways, it doesn't. It is kind of wonderful once in a while, you know, to to um, have uh, the, the the true virtual experience. You know, uh, uh, let's call it a virtuous experience of smelling the rose, of feeling the paper in in your hand that's written uh, in ink. Uh, and 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 looking at a piece of art, and the art on our coinage is is very special in another uh, regard that you that you pointed up very very well, and that's that it's a monumental piece of artwork in in the sense of the scope of what it's trying to convey, and yet they're very tiny, you know, they're very tiny entities. Uh, the penny uh, among the smallest, the dime is even smaller, but what they're carrying is incredible. Um, uh, incredible capsule summaries of history, and th the most wonderful thing about it, almost as wondrous as uh, the digital age we live in now, and the way information could freely um, cir circulate among the body politic and all over the world. These coins are little envoys; they're they're really little messengers, and and they carry a story. 
not unlike the way uh, you know libraries uh, carry the the hearts and minds and passions and content of 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 of, of genius across centuries without boundaries of time or space. So the coins have a life of their own, and it's it's kind of marveling, you know, it, it, it's marvelous. It is marvelous, and we were talking about this over dinner. Uh, I have a few Roman coins uh, in, in my collection, and uh, every time I look at them and hold them, I think somebody on the streets of Rome in 50 A.D. or whenever had this coin in his or her hand, and um, that person had no idea that over 2,000 years later, I would be looking at the same coin. It reminds me of years ago, I was at a flea market, and I bought a photograph for, I don't know, a, you know, a couple of dollars. And it was, it was a carte de visite, which was, you may know this, a kind of photography that was popular in the 1870s and 80s. It was almost like our equivalent of a, of a calling card. And, and on this uh, carte de visite, there was a picture of a woman who was looking up at the camera, and she, first of all, had like a very modern look in her eyes. And I couldn't help thinking then, and I still have this uh, carte de visite somewhere, that this woman couldn't ha have had any idea back in 1880 that over 100 years later, some guy would be looking at her, literally into her eyes in this, uh, in this photograph. So, you know, you know this better than I. These visual media have enormous impact, and they, they do make connections. And uh, coins are especially uh, at the apex of this because, if you think about it, coins are designed to be transferred from one person to another. So uh, the, the, the whole purpose of coinage is to buy things, which means the coins go into many hands and, and many uh, pockets. Let's talk a little bit more about the lithograph. And, and by the way, anyone who's listening to this podcast, I am going to put up uh, – a, a, a copy of that lithograph on the show notes to this episode of Light On, Light Through. And let me just spell that for you. That's L-I-G-H-T-O-N, L-I-G-H-T-T-H-R-O-U-G-H dot com. That's how you get to the web page. I hope I spelled that right. I have a tendency of leaving out a T or whatever, but it's Light On, Light Through. But to get back to the lithograph, which we will have a copy of on the uh, on the show notes, uh, you basically imagine that scene totally from scratch, or was there a photograph that was taken of the meeting between the two? Uh, it, because it's really an astonishing depiction, very vivid that that you did of that uh, July uh, 1908 meeting. Thank you, Paul. Actually, it's, it's it's such a good penetrating question and. The quick answer, since I've managed to go on on, on tangents and and, uh, and divergent paths, uh, the quick answer to it is that no, there, there is no photograph of it. It, it was a wonderful excuse for me, which uh, to do what I love to do, which is travel, you know, uh, out of the studio and experience and absorb, uh, you know, and collect information and and research. And so it, uh, that project took me to. Sagmore Hill and a wonderful, uh, wonderful gentleman who's a conservator at the, at the Theodore Roosevelt summer home there, uh, Mark Cosio, uh, gave myself and the gentleman who, who commissioned me to do this uh, lithograph a, uh, a private tour. Uh, we actually were there at off season, so, so we walked up to the door just like we were, you know, Roosevelt's guests, and we went in behind these, uh, uh, kind of uh, barriers, uh, kind of fences that were manufactured to handle the people that visited during tourist season, uh, and we walked into the rooms with the with the you know the rugs and and um, walked into his library, where Mark Cosio had mentioned um, was most likely uh, the place where Teddy Roosevelt would have entertained uh, sitting for Victor David Brenner. So I was I was there. I was taking photographs. I was making notes. I was making little kind of videos with my my camera. I was overwhelmed uh, looking at his own art collection. He was a, a very 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 knowledgeable uh, uh, gentleman, 
And uh, pretty much every book in his library existed as it was uh, in, in, in 1908. There were a couple of copies that were were added or, or were kind of mock-ups, but most of the uh, books were, you know, weather-beaten and worn, and uh, the room was filled with his presence. So I was absorbing that. It's kind of that whole kind of magical, mystical, mystical kind of uh, uh, thing we've been talking about. I think there's a tremendous influence of my speaking with the science fiction writer here, but but in, in, uh, the essence of who Theodore Roosevelt was in his own, you know, hand-hewn environment with his his own um, icons of inspiration, so to speak, in his in his library. You know, it's kind of a magical kind of uh, time traveling for me. I was traveling back a hundred years. No, there was no uh, photographic reference. There was a, a separate photograph that I looked at, a few of them, of Victor David Brenner and his New York studio. And uh, many different photographs of Theodore Roosevelt. I did what um, I did what uh, George Balanchine once said when he was, uh, uh, you know, complimented by being a great creative uh, uh, choreographer. He said, "Don't don't call me a creator. Uh, I'm much more. I'm mean, God is a creator. I'm much more like a, uh, you know an assemblage artist. I take this from that and that from." there and I put them together in a, in a new semblance and I think that's akin to the way I put that lithograph together um, and it, ha- it has it, it takes on its own life sometimes and hopefully in this case it took on its own sense of reality its own um, its own um, believable moment in time which is what I was trying to depict there well and, and you did that so well uh, Andre Bazin a French film critic who unfortunately died way too young, about 30, 40 years ago. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, the English translation is What is Cinema? Qu'est-ce que c'est le cinéma? And in that book he said, talking about photography, that what it does is the photograph rescues an image from its proper corruption in time. And I always love that. Uh, and, and I think what you have done with the Victor David Brenner Theodore Roosevelt litho is you, without the, the much easier uh, process, if someone had taken a photograph of that meeting, I mean, it might have been a wonderful photograph, but all that person would have been doing is is snapping the photograph. But you, in contrast, a hundred years later, re envisioned this scene, and and basically brought it back from, you know, the the emptiness of the sheer cosmos, back into something that everybody can now see. So I mean, you did even more than rescue an image from its proper corruption in time. You. You resuscitated an image which was already totally gone without any trace. And that's, that's an extraordinary accomplishment. What's even more extraordinary, Paul, is that as I'm listening to you very eloquently describe that, I actually believe that's what my intention was. And in this particular case, it doesn't always happen. But in this particular case, because of my enthusiasm and my sense of connection for it, and I, I pretty much have that with almost everything I do, but this had a very, very special uh, magic to it. Um, I, th- I, think, I think I did achieve that here, and, and it reminds me of what you were saying uh, precisely about looking at that uh, carte de visite. There is that magic. Uh, there's that transference. There's that moment. Uh, uh, I don't know how to really uh, d- describe it, but I think we both know what we're talking about, where there's that kind of synapse, uh, where kind of time and space... Uh, uh, you know, stand still or is uh, very, uh, you know, transferable or, or semi-permeable or whatever the case might be where, where you, you exist in, in, a, in a clear moment of grace almost and a perception where the, the woman in that carte de visite, as I hope Brenner, you know, eyeing and being so thrilled to be in the presence of this bigger-than-life uh, gentleman, this, this, this president, um, you know, uh, just as palpable and, and real, and even though, of course, it's a construct. You know, we speak of the French. Picasso said it uh, maybe even more uh, brilliantly than than uh, uh, than um, um, anyone when he said, "Art is a lie uh, that tells the truth, that reveals the truth." And the way when you think of it, you know, 
art is a semblance. It's, you know, uh, it's not a tree or a, a face. Uh, it's either colored grease on cloth if it's an oil painting or it's, a, it's a, you know, tonal uh, sounds that, that uh, at different wavelengths. But in the hand of someone who's creative, it can move the human heart and uh, and uh, open the human mind and uh, it's a magical thing isn't it? it it certainly is magical so here we are it's uh august 6 2010 uh-oh <laughs> so <laughs> let's let's talk about where you are and where these works of art are on this day and and where they're likely to go uh, first as far as the the new lincoln scent that you uh, helped design if somebody wanted to get that scent, how could they do it? Could they walk into a bank? I guess they couldn't walk into a bank and say, hey, could you give me the scent that Joel Iskowitz, you know, did the reverse of? But on the other hand, there must be some way of getting that scent. So maybe you can tell us about that. Well, since you, I, and and close family members and friends are the only ones who know that Joel Iskowitz, <laughs> you know, designed the, the reverse of the third aspect, Bicentennial uh, Lincoln Scent 2009, uh, someone would have been able to walk into a bank and, uh, you know, just order a few rolls. Uh, there was some sort of uh, difficulty with, um, with the uh, distribution of some of, of, some of these uh, coins uh, through the Federal Reserve System that, that's beyond my scope of understanding. But um, it turns out uh, that uh, they're in circulation they pop up rarely. rarely. Uh, there, were, there were four uh, issued in 2009, chronologically, depicting uh, you know, uh, major uh, portions of, of Lincoln's life. I just got one today, accidentally in change, in a handy stop uh, of uh, the first aspect, the log cabin. So they are out there. You can't walk into a bank easily and get them. You might be able to do that in a few cities. And the mint, I believe, is sold out um, of them, or is not selling them anymore. I'm not quite sure. That would have been one way. And then, of course, there's always a secondary market in this uh, magical world where everything is accessible, uh, you know, uh, via the internet. Uh, people can go on um, line and and pick up pretty much anything, I guess, on eBay and and at coin dealers and, and uh, for some sort of premium. Of course, it's now uh, in the secondary market, I believe. Well, I'm going to treasure the uh, the coin that you gave me. I was just thinking when I was a kid, getting back to when I used to be a coin collector, I used to go into the local bank and give them a dollar and ask them to give me, you know, two rolls of pennies. I, I drove them so crazy, they eventually refused to let me into the bank. <laughs> you know, it's like, but those were the good old days, you know, searching you know, for, the DV, for the VDB and who knows what else. Um, that's one thing I didn't know about you, Paul, that you were actually banned from the Bronx Savings Bank. I, I, it's very impressive. I, I know. Uh, I, I was got, I, years later, uh, as well as we're on this subject, uh, you know, if I was to get out to the world, I, I had a tax refund. I was about 18 or 19 years old from the government. And I had an account in another bank, and I went in, and I asked to cash it, and they gave me a hard time. They wouldn't cash it, so I had to cancel my account. So even back then, these banks uh, <laughs> caused a lot of aggravation. <laughs> but let's now talk about the litho and its availability. Uh, you, you still have the original what's what's happening with that uh, I do I actually um, uh, the litho is a limited edition of 250 which is rather you know uh, moderate to small in, in the world of commercial lithography or uh, and uh, maybe medium in terms of fine art lithography all right, that's great. I, you know, and just as I'm listening to you talk, I have to give some credit, actually a lot of credit, to the digital age because you and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. We wouldn't have, you know, gotten connected again after 50 years uh, had it not been for Facebook. And actually, props go to Jordy Axelrad, in case he was listening to this. <laughs> Joel and I had a, a great time back in fifth and sixth grade. I mean, we haven't told you, not the half of it, we haven't told you hardly any of it, and, and we're not going to tell you. But we're also having a, a great time now and delighted uh, to uh, to be back in touch with Joel. You'll see his artwork on the cover of the new pressing of my 1972 album, I hope, and on some of my science fiction publications. And I very much enjoyed this uh, conversation. Thank you, Paul. Thanks again.
the Light on Light Through podcast. And I want to thank Joel Iskowitz again for that interview. And even more importantly, tell you where you can see Joel and get some of this beautiful artwork that we've been talking about. Well, first, from August 10th to August 14th, the World's Fair of Money will be taking place in Boston, and Joel will be there on August 13th. He'll be signing lithos and other prints. You can find him at the Signature Art Medals booth number 120. So if you're in the Boston area or if you're a coin collector, you'd find it well worth going to. It's the convention for coin collectors. They have a webpage, worldsfairofmoney.com, and you can get more information about that. Next, you can go to Signature Art Medals directly anytime. Their webpage is signatureartmedals.com. That's S I G N A T U R E A R T M E D A L S dot com. And you can find Joel's work for sale there with lots of pictures. And last but certainly not least, you can get a lot of this stuff directly from. Joel. He has 25 artist proofs of the Theodore Roosevelt, Victor David Brenolitho, we were talking about in the interview. You can find him at his webpage. You can also write directly to him. That's probably the best thing. It's I S K A R T at H V C dot R R dot com. Or you can go directly to Joel's Mountain Studio webpage. That's themountainstudio.com. T H E M O U N T A I N S T U D I O.com. Don't you like these little spelling lessons? But if you go there, you can see all kinds of JPEGs of Joel's work. And by the way, at the lightonlightthrough.com webpage, we'll have all these links as well as an image of that Theodore Roosevelt, Victor David Brenner Litho. The Light on Light Through podcast. Hey, here's a special offer for all of you listeners of the Light on Light Through podcast. Audible.com is offering a free audiobook download with a free 14-day trial to give you a chance to check out their service. You can get bestsellers on audible.com. Hey, you can get a copy of The Plot to Save Socrates, my 2006 time travel novel, published originally by Tor Books. You can get a copy of The Consciousness Plague, one of my Phil D'Amato novels. You can get a copy of The Chronology Protection Case, This was my 1995 novelette, and the radio play of that novelette, which is available on Audible.com, was nominated for the Edgar Award by the Mystery Writers of America. So, download your first audio book today. You can do that at audiblepodcast.com dot com slash light on. I'll spell it out for you. A U D I B L E P O D C A S T dot com slash light on capital L I G H T O N. Again, that's audible podcast dot com slash light on for your free audio book. 